Right, welcome to the Profit Podcast. Mark Edmondson, uh, or Edmo, as I know you. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I've only been in the country um, eight days, so I've got all of my jet lag. Good to go. Yes, nice. Yeah, for those who don't know you, and we're going to get to know you in detail over the next hour or so, you've been living in Australia for quite a while, so it's probably best to start with a bit of background, like your sporting there's a lot to talk about here so try and give a reasonably succinct version because you've done a a lot in a kind of quite short well long space of time but you've done a hell of a lot so yeah give us a bit of your background people listening okay um so i'm english born um lancaster uh, northwest of england um when i went to high school Um, I was snapped up at rugby from the age of 11 to 17, just dedicated my whole life to wanting to be a professional rugby player when I left school. And um, fortunately for me, um, I got snapped up by St. Helens Rugby League um, at the age of 17, signed as a semi-professional, went through the academy system, made my debut for the first team at 19, um, went on to play nearly 150 first grade games, win. Well, I was a part of about nine championship wins. Um, I didn't play in all of them. I played in three, but I was a part of a wonderful era at St. Helens. Yeah. Um, played for England. And then the uh, the pinnacle of my career was um, being signed for the Sydney Roosters in Australia. Um, yeah, that was a bit of a dream come true because they, they are, the, well, still now one of the best teams in the entire world. Um, so went over there, followed the dream. Unfortunately, my body was a bit broken. I went out there with a broken shoulder. Um, I fractured my spine while I was there and uh, damaged vertebrae in my neck. Um, So coming towards the end of my twenties when I should be really in my prime as a, a well, uh, a contact athlete. Unfortunately, yeah, I had about one or two years left in me and I had to retire, but um, I was an opportunist and uh, I met an Australian girl and brought her back to England. And that's when I met you, Paul, you know, in my retirement first year, you know, becoming a personal trainer at Virgin Active all them years ago. Yeah. Um, and that led me to, then we had a child together and then she, she didn't like England, definitely not Manchester. And definitely now that I was uh, retired, uh, we emigrated to Australia and 15 years later, I've lived there. Nice. We, we'll go into everything you've done since you moved to Australia because there's a lot from there. But yeah. Um, yeah, that was where we first met when you just retired from, well, retired early from rugby league and uh, you were just entering into the world of personal training and then have gone on to do all sorts of things in coaching. Um, we'll come back to the rugby career in a bit because I'm interested to know, like, I think what will be useful today for people to hear because our listeners are personal trainers in their first couple of years of building a business up and have probably gone through a bumpy journey um you know lots of ups and downs lots of limiting beliefs and you know I, I can remember listening to your career as a rugby player and going Jesus Christ there's so many ups and downs in that <laughs> how do you deal with it how do you deal with that and, and still keep kicking on um and that was kind of when I first met you, that was infectious. You were, you were always looking for another opportunity. You were always positive. You were always kind of making your way forwards with things. And it, it rubbed off on me a lot. Yeah. So where was that first, where that was infamous, that instinct from? Oh, sorry. Uh, that infamous day I told you to leave your job. Can you remember? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this man that you're listening to right now is responsible for taking me from an employed personal trainer or a gym manager at the time, whatever my title was, to just going freelance and going for it and telling me to you know fuck it go for it leave your job and he made me do it and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life so I owe I owe a lot of that to you to be honest because I think I would have shit my pants I loved your Um, courage I loved your courage (laughs) (laughs) so where did that initial instinct to kind of keep going come from in your rugby career where did you get that drive from right That is a good question, but um, I I can explain this good. When you're committed, uh, Campy Paul. um, I call me Campy, I'll call you Edmo. Everybody knows who we are. When you are fully committed to something, life or death, um, you will jump off every single 
diving board. Do you know, it's like you got your first diving board, then you go up five meters, then you're 10, and you face a fear every time, and it's always different. Yeah. When you are obsessed, when you're committed, when you're all in, your resilience is built by every challenge that you're just all in. So with my rugby career, there was nothing else on this planet. That That's what I was designed for, born for. It was... There was nothing else. I was never going to work. It was only that. We'll talk about belief later, but this is this is belief. It's I've done it already. I just I'm just going to watch it unfold now and just put in the the, the skill set and the work. Um, that's why I've got a job now with the peak performance and the, and the mind training with athletes or whoever. That's the belief. You've got to go into everything. It's got to be done now. You've got to believe it now. So the commitment was um, every time I faced a fear, um, I had to challenge it anyway, because I was in, I was all in. So um, I would die basically. Um, so when it came to meeting you, I've got layers upon layers of playing against monsters, overcoming fears of running into them and getting killed. And, you know, training sessions where you have to push yourself to the absolute limits. You've got no excuses, you've been torn down every single day you build a resilience um but if you're all in you'll keep going until you're dead and you'll you eventually find out you don't die so when i retired i've got all this belief about life in me and that's why i just make a decision then i do it yeah all right so that's what i was saying to you what you're doing in here it doesn't work get out you know <laughs> you're active leave me yeah, but yeah, but no, just go. It doesn't work. And then, yeah. Yeah, go all in. Exactly right. And I think like sometimes you do have to do, you just have to go all in and, and see what happens. And then it builds resilience every time you see that you're not dead. Like you said, or you're yeah. not metaphorically dead. That you're not you're going to be all right. Yeah. And you're not bankrupt. And, you, you know, things can work out. It does start to build that resilience up. Definitely. Yeah. Um. So moving on to... So when you started, you moved to Australia and you started coaching people, taught people through what the, the rest of your coaching career has looked like. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's ups and downs. So I've had wonderful times where I've been playing sailing and just everything's happening so wonderful. Um, and I just now with, with a bit of wisdom of being in my 40s and uh, been through a lot, um, it's just a cycle. So you're always going to go up and there's always these peaks. Ride them, ride them while you're there, but um, be prepared for the unknown and, and new learnings. Uh, so we've got the cycle. When I went to Australia, I had a little bit of money left once I'd sold my house in Gatley. Um, and I packed my bags. We had a one-year-old daughter and um, I had about six months to live off the money. And I was going to plan to become a peak performance coach like Tony Robbins. Uh, he was my uh, idol at the time. And um, I thought I'll be a sport one of him. So um, I made a, a new vision of what I thought I was going to be. And uh, with the belief and the all in, I, um, I decided I'm going to be a public speaker um, anywhere, whoever will listen to me. And I came up with a few good talks that I think people wanted to listen to. So that was that one. Um, I did I did personal training in um, Australia for one year until I could transition into a full time uh, peak performance coach, which happened. And then I would work or do free seminars at schools, work with um, any young talent that really wants to make it. And I'd just pass on all my wisdom. While I was doing that, chucking myself into anything I could just to get myself around the town, the city uh, as known. Um, I just learned along the way. And it led me to, um, I got into the under 16s of an NRL team. That's like um, the, the premiership. Yeah. So it's Is like going rugby, rugby over the, uh, what's it called? Australian rugby. rules. There's Australian rules, um, which is AFL and there's NRL. Uh, and the NRL is the rugby league. So I got into like the under 16s of Manchester United and I worked there for four to five years, built a reputation, ended up in the first team. It was great. Um, 
It's funny how things happen once you're, you're loving what you do. Uh, we had a jujitsu sensei professor come in to help defense. And he liked my work and asked me, could I work with some of his fighters who were going to Japan to compete? They all came back, I think, with gold medals. Um, and then he introduced me to a UFC fighter. So then the next six years, I start working with UFC fighters and traveling all over the world. I left the NRL, the rugby. I was solely dedicated to fighters. I built up about 150 professional fighters on my roster, plus six UFC fighters. And there's still some current now. Yeah, that was six years. Then um, there was Usain Bolt. I uh, worked with him. Uh, that was brilliant in his transition from um, retirement. Then he had a trial at uh, football in Australia. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, never made it. But uh, wow, that was a great experience. And be just before COVID, I was uh, I, mean, I reached the pinnacle of my coaching peak performance career where um, I was the peak performance coach for the England Rugby Union first team with Eddie Jones. Yeah. Um, so I came in 2018. Eddie and the England team had come off five losses and um, any more, and you'd think Eddie would be sacked. Um, there was me and a, um, an, another rugby league player um, that I used to play against, and he joined, and um, we went on a tear then, 17 wins out of 21 and reached uh, the Japan World Cup against South Africa, and unfortunately we lost. Once that had finished, I went back to Australia to have a holiday, and I got caught with covid and I've been there ever since. And you got been there. <laughs> That's probably a good there. place to pause. Because yeah. um, that, and again, you did a really good job there, kind of, because you did a lot of stuff. I wanted to ask you about the UFC fighters, because I never knew how you got into that. So that was through the academy of the under 16s and the NRL and got spotted through that. Yeah. There's something to learn for that with trainers as well is that get stuck into things because you never know who you're going to meet. You never know what opportunities are going to be there. Some people call that law of attraction. I think a lot of that is just working hard and being open to opportunities and, and you know, getting stuck into things. It's how you um, make your own luck, isn't it? It's like when you look yeah. on the outside, someone would say that you're lucky, but you've made your own luck by putting yourself in those positions to receive it. So yeah. I think that's something that's, that people don't often acknowledge either. Yeah, um, there's a perception with personal trainers that I've I've observed and they're never really present. And the ones I have spoken to are, are just seeing human beings as, as money um, and they yeah. just want them in and they want them out and there's not a lot of presence. When I've worked with personal trainers in Australia, the first thing I do is, is saying, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself honest to God, they're human beings, they're watching you, if you're not present, you know, I've been there personal training, I'm just thinking, fuck, I want to get home, I want to have a beer, F this, I'm not even there, I'm just counting the reps, uh, I'm just like a robot, I'm just not even listening to what they're talking to me about, like, we've all been there, I imagine. The PT's nodding along now going, yep, yeah, yeah. like that. Um, at least once a time. That's where you, you, you're missing the whole point. Get out of the game if you like that. Um, everyone should be looked at as a case study with love, with preparation, with connection, because you don't know who, no, you don't know who they know for one, but it doesn't matter who they know. Like, if you love what you do, you want to see this person achieve the goals, be healthier, you know, uh, be happier in life. And that's that's the perception that I really encourage people to to be. Uh, do not see these as money. It's a human being, and when you take care and really look after and nourish that person, you get you get you get feelings of contribution, fulfillment, all that through that. And it's it is it's the law of attraction then that's through. It's you're connecting with a love of purpose. That's what that is when you do that. So then possibilities come from the unknown, which I love. Expect the unexpected. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and you're, you're all in there because you're working on purpose. Yeah. Your purpose is in place and you're working in the right place. So you're all in. 
and that's when you do work with love and passion and commitment and you know you will die for the person in some respects like you will do more than they're willing to do to start with because you want them to succeed and then that rubs off on them yeah, yeah. that's class i wanted when i said pause after all the kind of because that was a lot of your highs right now i think it's worth people listening as well to some of the challenges that you've had over the years and some of the lows mm. um because it's been a it's been an up and down journey some of them highs are like amazingly high and then I know that there's been the flip side of that as well. So how have you dealt with challenges over the years, times like when it's not been plain sailing? Yeah, well, there's, um, from my childhood, 10 out of 10, amazing childhood. Um, time during school was all rugby. It was all fantasy. It was amazing. My whole career, apart from just the, the you know, the times when I was dropped and I was depressed because I was dropped and I was losing my career. They weren't really hard times. Hard times was when I retired. Um, luckily for me, I studied NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which um, you're familiar with, and went into the psychology, sports psychology, and, and, and I've been a, um, a constant student. Um, I now know that I lost my identity um, right. because when I retired, then who was I? Because, you know, I went into conversations with people at least another six months after that, and they're asking me who I am, who am I, what do I do? And I was always referring back to the rugby, and then I got reminded one day, no, that's who you was, who are you now? And I'm, I was fucking struggling. Um, <laughs> we, we all have um, a sense of, of identity, and it doesn't matter what identity makes you happy, but we have them. So it could be a bodybuilder. It could be someone with tattoos. It could be someone in sport, a mother, a father, a job title, a car. You've got an identity. And as long as it's not hurting anyone, all right, it's perfectly healthy. Um, what I realized until I realized uh, was I needed to create a new one, a new fucking awesome one. Something that had meaning, purpose that excites me. Um, and eventually I got to that. But um, in the process of about six months, I got suicidal thoughts, not suicidal thoughts. I lost hope. I lost vision. I, I, I didn't have the answers for a while. And when you get that, it stunts your inspiration to do anything. I didn't want to do anything. And I just went into a depressed state. Um, but eventually I got sick of that, sick of drinking, sick of being down and out because that just wasn't my DNA. Um, and then eventually I, I look back on what got me to my rugby career. And it was in the beginning stages, it was creating a vision. I, yeah. I saw myself at Twickenham singing the national anthem for England when I was 11. And then I was out, do you know, like the little football kids where they're kicking a the ball and they're pretending to be a player in the back garden on the field on their own. That was me. That's imagination. So I had to go back to that and see myself as what I am now. Um, and that spurred me on. So that was one really bad time. So I, that was the first time I really had depression. All right. A depressed state. There's two types of depression. There's one which is my life ain't going the way I want it. So I'm going to sulk. <laughs> That's what it is. Hey, it's, it's actually not bad. So if you're in depressed, depressed state, number one, that's, that's not bad. That's just slap across the face with a big smelly kipper. After you sulk, get, get the fuck up, get a notepad out and start visualizing and writing down a plan of something fucking exciting. Sorry to swear. That's all right. You can swear on this. Not a problem. Good. So that's depression number one. Depression number two is a clinical issue, which no matter what drugs you're on, no matter what amazing partner you've got, money you've got, fame you've got, you're depressed. It's a, it's a hormonal issue. It's normally to do with poisoning. All right. It could be terrible diet. Um, it can be hormones out of whack. It can be cancer. It can be all sorts. So the people that are really trying to be happy and trying to be motivated, but just have got this shadow on them, that's a clinical number two. And that needs serious, serious care from professionals. Yeah. Um, the other one, the majority, you know, number one is just 
my life's not going according to plan and I'm fucking shutting down for a while and I'll drink myself to death sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've been there. Um, then I went on a lovely journey, very much mirroring my rugby career, learn, fail, learn, fail, learn, fail. I was all in. So it was just amazing, you know, the whole way. Um, and I, yeah, so it's recently, so recently. So when I worked for England, um, I finished out my contract. I went back to Australia just to work out, shall I stay back in England after this holiday and really give it a good long-term plan with working in rugby or just being in England in general, because I've, I've got a lot of contacts. And then the pandemic hit. Um, so I didn't believe I didn't believe it was going to hang around for more than three months. So I just thought I'll extend my holiday. I lived with a friend and, and fucking hell, what a holiday it was. It was, um, let's get up in the morning, go out training, go for a walk, do some work on the business. And every five at five o'clock every day, bottles of wine are out. Um, so <laughs> this, this habit became, yeah, every, every single day. And then this, problem in the world kept on extending and then going into the next year this habit had been building i've been drinking a lot and um I, what i found eventually um i started to lose hope on the future because of what was happening um i couldn't travel because travel bans were on uh, vaccination um mandates were all being put out and i was just no 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 no, 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 I'm not doing this. And then I started to put my CV out in the event of in the future, I might be able to get some work. And it was all triple vax. You all had to triple vax and you had to get your travel passport and we all have to be in bubbles. And I'm just like, oh my God, my life work is over. Um, so for a period of about three to six months, um, again, I... Um, I didn't hit a, dis a, a depressed state. I went from, oh shit, to despair. <laughs> and um, yeah, I got myself in a, a bit of a tangle for a while. And then again, bounced back and um, get, I got clean of everything, stopped having takeaways, got back training again, rewrote a new vision, stopped drinking, stop going out, stop, you know, you, you, you just put it all to bed. And then um, for the last year and a half, I've just been on fire. And it, uh, I think when you're down there, you, you've got an opportunity to really learn. When, you, yeah. when you're having a bad time, surrender, just go, oh, fuck, it's one of them times. And, and just revel in it and just be like, all right. Yeah, every time I've been down there, it's just like whoo, massive peak afterwards. Do you think, because I was listening to another podcast today while I've been doing some bits and pieces, and there was a similar story to that, and, and they said the same thing about when they were down, they learned to kind of accept it but not and, and stop denying it was happening. And I think that's part of the journey. I think if you, you know, you're going to have periods where you are down for a trainer now listening to this and they're two years in, my bet is there's been periods of being, you know, losing a bit of hope, losing a bit of vision, or not being connected to the vision that means yeah. you're not quite all in then you start to feel a bit what's the point and I think you've got to listen to that I think you've got to kind of you know sit back and go I've got to feel this I've got to feel it going on so that I can get to the next level I've got to I've got to understand where it's coming from I've got to understand how to cope with it was that the case for you you almost had to give in to it um, yeah you bit. surrender you surrender to it so um a good one is to have a bit of a sense of humor. Um, right. Like again, it's like a tantrum. We have a we have these tantrums and then and then we go to sabotage ourselves. Like so strange. But um I had a, a sense of humor with myself. And every time I caught myself being soft, it's like a test of character. Are you weak as piss or what? Like, are you whinging on the phone? Are you like stop it? Like <laughs> stop are you dying right now are you on the street homeless like 
you, there's different perspectives. So I find myself coaching myself. Um, the biggest thing that I think's now come into my life was journaling. Right. Um, I have always have a journal and there's three parts of a journal. It can be therapy. So you can start every morning when you wake up, you're writing down everything that's bothering you. And you can, you can, thera you can do therapy on yourself and coach yourself into the solutions. And that's what I did. Um, what's, what's the three most biggest thing that's really an obstacle right now? Then the next questions are like, what, what ideas have I got to, to overcome this? What possibilities can I get out of this? How is this making me feel? And so I had a journal and, um, that was really, really powerful. Um, you can talk to other people, but if, if you have sound of mind, if you're not dealing with something really, really powerful, like an addiction that's taking control of your life, we can literally with a pencil or a pen on a notepad, we can coach ourselves out of every problem. We really can. Yeah. Journaling's always been something we're really kind of pro about as well. And it's amazing the amount of people are quite resistant to journaling. I don't know if you think the same, Matt, but sometimes people say, well, that, will that really work? Or they might give it a go for a few days and then they're like, oh, it's nothing's really changed. Like how you've been consistently journaling for how long, Edmo? Um, about a year, solid. Right, now, solid. Now yeah. it's like non-negotiable. No one's coming anywhere near my time when I'm journaling. I get up at five, by half past five, I'm journaling till about half six or seven. Um, I've got one part which could be the therapy if I need it. So that could be two questions I think this morning. Is there anything, Mark, you need to clean up this morning? And what I mean by cleaning up is, is there any, is, is there any like worries creeping in, any doubts? Um, is there something bothering me? And, and how you know is we've, we've got this wonderful guidance system, our feelings. If, if we keep getting through the day, wonderful feelings, excitement, you know, fulfillment and stuff like that, we're heading in the right direction. But if we're getting fireworks of all this contrast, which is, you know, we're not happy, then something needs to be cleaned up. And that bloody subconscious, the 60,000 thoughts a day, and you're not, you're not very aware of, of any of them. So to be able to grab them first thing in the morning, and I yeah. start with, how are you feeling today? Um, how's your body? What are you thinking about? What's on your mind? Um, what are you excited about today? What was good about yesterday? What are you grateful for? Is there anything we need to clean up? today what's bothering you how can you improve more like it's just incredible so for the last year this has become my absolute love and i i don't see myself ever stopping it like yeah. it yeah um, i love the, the awareness part is massive and something that i've always done with people when they get stuck a little bit with the feeling side is because sometimes people's uh, vocabulary around, around feelings is surprisingly small if you ask them what feelings have you had today, they might go happy and sad. Yeah. What, what else? And it, that, yeah. That's it. Now, I think you've had a few more than that. So actually getting them to kind of increase their vocabulary around feelings and experience them and label them and connect them to things, you know, that's, that's powerful stuff for people. Just that, just that exercise to make them go, Do you know what, I can be, I can probably experience 10, 20, 30 emotions in one day. Yeah. Normal, very normal. Well, the thing is, they're not looking. They're not looking to to identify these emotions. It's just, it's not taught. Um, mm. And the thing is, with your vibration, the feelings that you are feeling, you're attracting what you're feeling. So if you're not aware of them, you're creating loads of shit in your life that you might not want. Mm. Tune into it. Yeah. I think with journaling, if you are going to go down that route, because I've, I've, similar to, to you, Mark, I've done it for quite a while now. I, I, I quite like keeping mine and looking back on them as well. I've got a few of them just below me here. And uh, I think, I think you've got to think of it as something like almost like brushing your teeth. Like if, if you, if you didn't brush your teeth for one day, you might not notice the difference, but if you don't do it for a month, yeah. you're going to see a different. And it's one of those things where you've got to, you've got to just keep on top of it. And you might be six months in before you notice that it's made any impact. Yeah. Um, 
But then once you notice that impact, I do think it's quite difficult to sort of ever see yourself stopping. I've got to the point now where I'm not as strict as you in terms of I don't I don't do it every single day, but I do it at least four or five times a week. Yeah. Um, and I've sort of shortened my process down a little bit because I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Yeah. But you, um, I think you get good at asking yourself the right questions. I do. Um, I, I, well, you've found your system there, so it's, it's different to everyone else. Um, now, I say to people, don't do a journal just for the sake of doing it. You know, do it when it works. There's some days where I, I do. I No, there's no time for a journal. I've got nothing to really talk about today. It just it depends on your system. And um, I love what you said before about looking back. Um, I've got a part of the journal where I predict the future. So I, I write premonitions down. And I love to go back and have a look. And they fucking come true. And I mean, I've always <laughs> done this. This is a part of the visualization and the law of attraction. It's amazing. Like, yeah, you can use that book, honestly, for so many things. Yeah. And that helps reinforce great beliefs as well, because I do exactly the same as that. It sounds like we all three of us look back over old journals. Yeah. And it's really good to go back and go, I remember when I wrote that, I was shit scared. Yeah. And I've now actually done it. done it. So now the next thing you write, you're, gonna, you're more accepting of that feeling. Then when you go, oh, this is scaring me. You're like, yeah, but I've done stuff like this before. So you get more confidence, more belief yeah. from it. So it's, it's a great exercise to do. Proof uh, really helps develop belief. Yeah, 100%. Um, that was awesome, that. Uh, I want to go through, because you've, you've had both ends of being in elite sport, being coached. But I want to know what was a great coach for you when you were a player? Yeah. Like, who did you really respond to? What were the skills that if a trainer's listening to this, they can go, some really key things to pick up on that they might not know and then from the other end when you were coaching at an elite level within the sporting side of things or go specific on that what did you notice you had to do to get the players and the athletes and the fighters and how did you coach them to uh, to, to win right. so let me just clarify them two questions one was what coach did i like that made me yes. react perform and what did I do when I was coaching at England to get the players to listen to what I was saying right yeah that's it 100%. And this relates to all the personal trainers like I was saying at the beginning um I don't know if I have said it actually yet but um about about being real being fully invested and authentic and not it's the, it's the, it's the coaches that are just they're not there they're just they're just following orders do you know what i mean there's no soul you don't trust that guy as far as you could fucking throw him you know yeah. he's only there for himself he's just looking straight through you he asks you a question you tell him the answer and he didn't hear it yeah you know how's your day today oh yeah and then you you know them people don't you they, they just ask yeah. things for the sake of it um there was two types of coach that really stood out to me in my St. Ellen's days. They both got really good uh, results, but there was one I preferred. So there was Ellery Hanley, the most, one of the most famous rugby league players in, on, this, on the planet, actually. Um, yeah. He was my coach when I was 19. He didn't need to have an ego because he'd done everything. It's all done. He's achieved it all. He didn't need to compete against us. He, he was so nice. He was firm. He was gentle, but he was an encourager. So I missed three tackles one game. You're lucky if, if you're allowed to play again the next game if you miss one, right? <laughs> this is how he dealt with it. He, 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 didn't, he didn't bring it up on video and show me in front of every player and embarrass me. He didn't talk to me about it in front of anyone. He come up to me and whispered in my ear, Mark. I went, yes, Ellery. He goes, you missed three tackles at the weekend. And I went, yep, yep, I did. And he goes, good. And I went, what do you mean good? And he goes, it's a time for you to stay behind and work on your tackling until you miss none. And I went, yeah, and he goes, you're going to do that, aren't you? And then when you play again, you're not going to miss any tackles, are you? And I went, no. So he was 
it was really smart how he did it. I believed him. He was gentle. And every single day I would work because he had a bit of faith in me. He didn't scold me. And did I miss any tackles? Fucking, I don't think I missed a tackle for 15 games after that. But I constantly, from that talk, remembered how gentle and nice and encouragement and encouraging he was. And I never forgot it. And I played my heart out, right? Then he got fired. And an Australian, Ian Millwood, the famous Ian Millwood, who went on, you know, wonderful success run with St. Helens. He was the opposite. He would embarrass me, ridicule me, um, threaten me, pull me to one side. Um, Do you like your car? Do you like your house? Well, if you don't play this week, you're gone, mate. Yeah. So I hate, I I had no respect for him. He was only a little short guy. Um, he inherited an amazing team, but yeah, he did he, he did know some stuff coming from Australia and being connected, but um, he had a chip on his shoulder. He was tiny. I don't think he'd ever played rugby. Um, he, he was a bit of a bully, and um, there was not a lot of respect for that man. Um, there was respect as a team, and he was a part of it, but individually, I'm, I'm not sure many people liked him, and I definitely didn't like him, but he made me perform, but he made my life misery, and I wouldn't suggest that if possible right that's really interesting the one the first one with Ellery Hanley you remember every word of that that was every the first word. thing I noticed about that that stuck with you as a moment yeah and those kind of moments change your life it like, did change my life yeah yeah I was and like I'm gonna, a positive way. I, yeah I'm gonna be that guy yeah that became part of your identity almost like we've it been is. talking about yeah yeah the second one sounds like it got results on the field it, yeah, uh, my mum said. Impression. Say again. But left a different impression. It got results on the field, but yeah, it's not sustainable. Uh, ridiculing. Um, yeah, I know. I know many more coaches like that. They do not give a shit about sustainability. They'll just replace you. Um, so um, they want results now, and this is a lot, a lot like the big businesses. This is how it can get. Um, and if that's the case, you have to be adaptable and become your environment. So if uh, the good thing is I showed character, I hated the motherfucker and, um, I ended up lasting longer at that club than he did. So, um, I got the result. Anyway, it was a test. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Two brilliant stories there. So going into like you as a coach. Are you going to tell us now that you exploded and embarrassed some one of your athletes at some point? <laughs> oh, oh, this is, a good, this is a good story. So, um, Eddie Jones has lost five games with England 2018. Lost three, two games to South Africa, lost to the Barbarians. Um, I can't remember who else they lost to. So, when I flew in for the interview, um, I heard from the grapevine that um, the previous psychologist had been let go. And when the final date of that psychologist had finished his work, I was to be flown in and replace him. Now, I, I did my research and I, had, I wanted to find out about who this guy was. Um, I'm not naming any names and stuff like that, but I heard it was a very standoffish sort of typical psychologist where they're observing in the background and everyone feels like they're on eggshells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, especially in rugby, I mean, it's only been the last five, 10 years where sport, sports psychologists have really been coming into it. It's still alien. Like that's one of the coaches that was always, oh, fuck off. We don't need that shit. Um, so I, I got told that, there wasn't really um, rapport. There wasn't really connection with this guy. He was just a guy that was dodgy, just hanging around. It, that might be wrong. That's what I heard. So my first approach was in NLP, which I learned all them years ago, Paul, relate to someone as soon as possible. Build yeah. rapport. Be authentic. Be fucking real. Like Northerners, for God's sake, were the most real motherfuckers out there. So I thought, do you know what? I'm Northern. Uh, most of the players on the team, there's there's quite a lot of Northerners. I'm just going to, I'm an ex-rugby player. I get it. Whatever he did, I'm going to do the opposite. 
So um, I'll give you an example. There was a team doing rehab, a team doing weights, a team doing skills, team doing fitness. And there was four breakfasts. So they'd all get showered, come for breakfast. I went for breakfast with all of them. Everyone had four breakfasts, one after the other. <laughs> and wherever they went for coffee, I'd go and just plonk myself right in front of them all and make them talk to me. And eventually I got, I got in there because um, one, I'm a rugby player. I've been a rugby player. So they get me. Um, there was Andy Farrell's son, Owen Farrell. So there's reports straight away. Northerners, St. Helens, Wigan. Um, there was players on the team that watched me and my St. Helens team. I was in, mate. I was in. As soon as, soon as like, we, we were talking about girls, we were talking about retirement, we were talking about league, union. Once I got the laughs and I felt everyone's energy come down, then it was Edmo, morning Edmo. And I'm like, morning mate, how you doing? And now I can do my coaching. So when I did sit down with them, I cared for them. I, I used stories and, and I, built, I built like boundaries, safety boundaries with them. So I said, look, I'm not gonna run off Teddy Jones and, and, and tell him everything that you're saying, right? I'm here, I'm here for you, right? Tell me your borderline secrets. Like, what are your fears coming into this place? What, like your whole, you can tell me stuff basically. And they did, and they opened up. And um, sometimes um, it wasn't like therapy, anything like that. It was just like um, everyone had their different personalities and believe it or not, even at the highest level they had things that they'd like to talk about and didn't know who to talk with. And it was just a matter of trusting someone. And once they knew that I wasn't relaying what they were telling me, then they felt comfortable to talk even more. And after a while, I got, I got players from honest to God, like rating out four out of 10 to just all firing on 10 out of 10 and getting man of the matches in certain games. So I, I really do believe that was down to being real, just just being real. There wasn't a lot of like magic ones going ding, fucking, you know. Uh, it was just a good old chat and working a few things out, and um, that was it, and it worked. There's a, a really good another good lesson in there for personal trainers. So the the rapport building at the start, I th a lot of trainers that we coach do definitely dive in to the technical stuff too soon. So they meet the person, they start going, right, I have to write them the best exercise program and they have to be on a, a really good nutrition plan with strict calories and, and X, Y, Z. And I've got, I've got to show them how skilled and how talented I am. And they forget that you try and get to know them first and try and be friends. Yeah. And if they like you, they'll keep coming back. And that gives you the time to work with them. Like how long was it before that had to do? some of the work you wanted to do with players um yeah um i think i observed for, i think i observed for a week um, right. just just being around um we were in um in portugal in a training camp and yeah so i was just there for every meeting and i wasn't being needy like trying to push force myself into them i'd just float around and be real genuine and after a while they accepted me um this is a big tip for personal trainers. Um, be genuinely interested. Remember the names. Remember the pet. Remember the kids, the parents, the job. Remember the conversations. Write it down when you go away and show true interest. And, and next time you pick up with them, you can start off where you left off. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And you're showing general interest. How, how did your daughter do in her exams? Like it means so much. Yeah. Um, and then also that leads on to then tell me about you. What are you here for? Well, Mark, I, I've become so busy at work that I've, I've lost the love for myself. Um, I've put weight on, I'm ashamed of my body. Um, I, yeah, I've lost my discipline. Please help me get me discipline back. All right. All right. And then you, you, you elaborate on that and you come back with a plan that, to help them with it and bring them discipline, like light them up, you know, make they, make them fans of you by showing them interest in them being real. Yeah, you show them genuine interest and they'll give you genuine answers. 
like you said there, they'll, they'll actually open up and say, here's what's really causing me pain. Here's where I'm really struggling. And I really want some help. And if you get that connection with people, that's, you're going to get the results because they're going to stay for a period of time. And that means they're going to sustain what you want them to do. So yeah. it's really important, really important. That's class. Right. That leads us lovely into kind of a last little section I wanted to, to ask you about would be how do you work? How would, what's your structure for, for working with people? So we've got like step one there is build that relationship and be genuine and be genuinely interested. And I guess as well, if you're not genuinely interested, if it's not the right person for you to work with, I guess don't feel too bad about saying no. Turn yeah. them away. Yeah. So if that's step one, what's what's the rest? Um, go on, just, just to explain that last bit again. So what's my my system with, with people? Yeah. What's the structure? How, what's the system you use? How do you work with people? Um, imagine... Imagine you've been a personal trainer for years and you just write down again on a notepad or a spreadsheet, all the things, all the, all the things that really work for you. Then you go and listen to the best people in your field and you get ideas. And basically I've just got lists of all different strategies that I can help someone. Um, I've got the beginner basics, which is um, free introduction with anyone. Tell ask them to tell me, me at what they want, what they you know they're struggling with, what's their vision, and all that sort of stuff, um, and then from there, I go I go right back to basics. The first thing I want to know in creation with anyone, it doesn't matter where they're at, it's um, what do we need to get clear on now? And the first thing I tend to go with is tell me your vision. Most personal trainers out there right now, the first thing I would say doesn't matter where you're at, what's standard. Go and spend half a day with a notepad and rewrite your vision. Check your vision on every level. Who's my clientele? Am I getting results with them? How much money am I turning over? How am I? What, what is this business vision? on? How does it operate on all levels? Right? You can get really um, some good tips on this by going on YouTube and looking at people, how they've got their business, the ones that are really thriving. Yeah. Then you, you can like, where am I in relation to that? So the first thing I do with any athlete is tell me about this vision. What, what have you got coming up? So say it was, um, I, I have a lot of fighters. Um, I find out where they are, what the record is, what's their aspirations. And then I check them uh, to, to find out how well they know what they want. And a lot of them are very vague about what they want in the future. So now if you're very vague and you're falling in love with being a personal trainer, the idea of it consciously, it's quite easy. You get your qualifications, you join a gym, you start networking around and eventually you'll pick up, you know, um, some clients and, and, and off you go and you can do that for years. But the depth is what I'm on about the depth, like, are you packed out? Are you living with purpose? Are you transforming people? Are you fucking excellent on every single level? Like there's so many layers to the business, isn't there? Um, yeah. People get in love with an idea and then they're into it. And, and that's just not good enough. And one or two years down the line, they're wondering why they're not progressing. So getting clear and then communicating it to the subconscious. So, Number one is revisiting that vision statement, this, this plan. Yeah. My, my winning formula when I was an athlete was daydreaming about the vision. It was always about the vision. It wasn't goals. It was the vision. It was a story. It was the fantasy. And when I retired, I had to create a new fantasy about being the Tony Robbins of sport and yeah. living in the high rise and traveling the world and working with UFC fighters and, and all that. I visualized all that before it happened, but it started with pen to paper. Then it start, started with consciously contemplating it. Then when I was dead set, that's what I'm having. That sounds cool on every layer. Then I started to visualize it. If you're not doing the subconscious work, you are pushing the cart up a hill. Right? So once I get really clear or get these athletes clear, then I've got an audio visualization program 
where I'll get them to go forward in the future and relive it and feel it. What we're looking for is the feeling now. Yeah. The feeling now of all that. And you, and you keep practicing that. And then you keep a check on yourself with the journal in the morning. You know, uh, how was yesterday? What do we need to improve on? What was the feedback? Did you, did you coach with purpose? Was you well prepared? Like, you following me? Yeah, I am. Yeah, that, and that's, I want to highlight that step you've just said there about having the feeling now. That is a really important thing to be doing because our behaviours, our day-to-day behaviours are driven from how we feel. It's yeah. our, how we feel, how our perception. So when people go into something going, well, how do I feel today? They say it's a weight loss goal and they say, well, I still feel fat. You're going to behave like a fat person. Yeah. And those behaviours aren't going to get you to where you want to be. So you have to be able to visualise yourself better than you are today and yeah. connect to that feeling so that your behaviours are going to follow down that path. Yeah. So psychology 101, in that one statement, especially NLP as well, you have just affirmed to yourself, you don't feel good, you are fat. Yeah. Right. So now the subconscious who is obviously feeling fat and thinking fat and you've just affirmed to him again. So there's where where is the skinny person there? When you do visualization, this is how you authentically talk to the subconscious mind. The subconscious is pictures. It's feeling. It's not words. It's feeling. Um, when I've been overweight, when I was doing all the drinking in 2020, whatever, yeah, I think it was, I put on 15 kilos of weight. I, I inflamed. I was eating Uber Eats every night and stopped training and a couple of bottles of wine. And it wasn't long before I had big bloated cheeks, you know, fat belly. But the thing is, I knew what it was like to be slim and ripped. Mm. And I just stayed there. And it didn't matter what's there. We, the body will change. You've got to, you've got to go and fantasize and live there and practice. It, it, it's all about practice. It really is. Um, if you want anything, get clear on the vision and then visualize it and put time every single day to be there and then put it to bed and off you, off you go with your day. And you're going to feel a lot much, you're going to feel a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. And then that kind of toolbox of strategies that you've got then is about picking the right tool for each person. It, that's kind of the rest of the process. Once you've put the message in that you're slim and you're ripped by your visualization, fantasy, and you're feeling it and you're there for about 25 minutes. I do it. Well, most days, um, then when you least expect it, your subconscious will find you all the ideas and everything to get you slim. It will give you the energy. So when you're affirming, I don't feel good today, I'm, I'm still fat, then it's affirming that you've got no energy to do anything because you're going to stay fat. If you're visualizing fucking training the house down, personal best, waking up with abs in the morning, it's going to go, oh, that's me now. Okay, cool. Let's burn all this fat. Okay, cool. Wake up in the morning. Fuck, I've got loads of energy. Let's go training. Like, honest <laughs> to God, it's like day and night when you program yourself right. If I could do anything with people struggling, it would be, right, we just have one session writing out the vision and then testing them. How does that feel? How does that make you feel? Read it to me again. And they read it and then they're smiling. I'm like, right, let's start visualizing it. Visualize it for a month, every single day, 25 minutes using my audio. And, and they become it. And it doesn't take long. Yeah. Change can happen fast when you start to make those big inner changes. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I think we're, we're about ready to wrap. We've got an hour, but I want to stick in a couple of questions that one's for me. And I know Matt's got one he wants yeah, to ask please, you. Please, Matt was. Ones. Do you want to go first, Matt? I think I know who you want to know it was to what it was like to work with a certain person. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I saw this on your Instagram bio, and then obviously you mentioned his name earlier on. But Paul asked me, "What questions do you want to ask Edmo?" And I was like, "I've only got one. What is it like to work with Usain Bolt?" Oh, Usain, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the first time I met him was um, I was in all. I joined the coaching staff of this uh, this football club in in Sydney. 
They were called the West. Yeah, he had a trial for, wasn't it? They were called the Central Coast Mariners Football Club. Yeah, yes, and yeah. in pre-season, um, he'd been signed, and then he was guaranteed two games, and then he was going to be assessed whether we sign him for the full season. So my agent said, "This is an opportunity for you, Edmo. You're going to go and literally stay there. So we're going to put you, get you." Um, hotel and you're just going to be around you saying every day and if he needs you uh, you're going to do present present you're going to present in front of him if he needs you you're there and the, the other players I'm I'm like I'm in anyway so I'm in the coaching staff and um, I'm with the coaching staff and I'm in the coaching room and in the morning the players come into the coaching room and shake all the, the coaching staff's hand and I'm counting every person that comes in and I'm just waiting for him. And then next minute he walks in six foot six frame, just incredible, you know, coat hanger shoulders. He's a giant and he was very polite. And it wasn't long until I was presenting in front of the whole team and the staff and he had to sit right at the front. Um, I had a panic attack and, um, I got through it, but I couldn't believe that I was talking about the champion mindset while he's just there at the front looking at me like that. I swear <laughs> to God. Um, but after a while, to answer your question, Matt, um, he was just out of earth. He was a nice guy. Um, he was good at one particular sport, just like I was, just like, you know, we've all got our talents. Um, yeah, and after a while, I wasn't starstruck at all. It was just an ordinary person. To be to be honest, but um, the stature of the man and the aura is something I do talk about in in my other uh, chats and podcasts and stuff. When you know someone's special, I mean we're all special, right? But I I've only felt this a few times where someone walks in a room and they command the whole space without saying anything. Have you ever mm-hmm. felt that? Yeah. Yep. Uh, one was Andy Farrell, who used to be the England rugby player, he used to play for Wigan. Um, He was six foot five, he was a monster, but a wonderful player. And I can remember him just like ducking under the, ducking under the door. Um, (laughs) And he had this aura about him and he didn't have to say anything, but everyone was watching every move he made. And the, the vibration was pretty powerful. So I felt that with you saying with Andy Farrell, there was a couple of others like Johnny Wilkinson and, um, few other yeah mega stars but um not everyone so that was it that was cool for me awesome what an experience um and the one i wanted to ask about because i watch a lot of ufc and i was really interested in what those guys are like to coach because you get the impression they'd be absolute renegades to go into a sport like that and really enjoy it like they seem to what are they like to coach um they were, uh, to, to, to be truthfully honest, compared to my past being in rugby, yeah, uh, it's so professional, so elite professional. Um, it was borderline amateur. It, honest to God, it was borderline anim- amateur. They, they didn't have kit. They were late to training. They weren't organised. Um, but the one thing that they, they decided on was they were going to fight. They were going to fight. So let's get as fit as I can, make the weight and and get in that cage and have a fight. And that's pretty much it. Because I was training with some of the the athletes and say like fitness and strength, knocking them out of the ballpark. They just had nothing. Um, When it came came to their, you know, speciality, rolling on the mat, and and sparring with them, yeah, I got fucking owned. But um, <laughs> if if I'd have dedicated myself to maybe you know a year or two at mixed martial arts, then it would have been a different story. But um, no, they they're they're a special breed. They're, they're the closest to a Viking, you know, a warrior going to war. Um, they're going to war, and and to get in there, I saw. I saw something in their eyes that you don't see in a rugby player, you don't see in any other sport. They were primitive, you know. Yeah. Um, it's something that I would have been interested in myself 
if I hadn't have taken up 20 plus years of rugby? Well, there's still time. I'm knowing you, mate. There's still time to throw in some last minute oh, UFC fights. Yeah. Arthritis. <laughs> I've got arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> and well, that's been um, awesome today. That's been really interesting chat. And I think, you know, listening back to that, if you're a PT, you'll pick out lots. I was going to say three or four, but there's probably 10 to 15 bits in there that people could apply to their business. So, Thanks very much for today. Back in the UK, so no doubt we're going to have many, many coffees and, and chats yeah. and catch-ups yeah. now. Um, and I look forward to those. But let everybody know who's listening where they can find you on the places like Instagram or are there any handles that you can let people know about? Yeah, so if you just type in Mark Edmondson on um, Instagram, um, I think I'm Team Edmondson actually on Instagram um, and Mark Edmondson on Facebook. Um if you get stuck with loads of Mark Edmondson, just put Team Edmondson and um, you'll find me. And I'm open to chat with anyone. Anyone want to send me a private DM, a question, a free consultation? Um, pick my brains about UFC or anything else? No, no problem. Oh, <laughs> Ampy, I think one of your questions was um, to, to ask about this. Can you remember? I'm a champion. Yeah. Let's finish on that, actually. Yeah, I wanted to, I forgot to throw that one in about champion on a, on your worst day. So, yeah, that's your logo, the slogan that are on all your yeah. merchandise, T-shirts, everything. Explain yeah. what that means. Let's finish on that. Um, so when I when I played for St. Helens, uh, we had, this is good for PTs as well, um, leave your bags at the door. So what that meant was when you come to training, this is a champion team, as we were. Um, it was the highest pinnacle of rugby. They were the standards. And you, if you're in the first team, you had, if you're lucky, three strikes and you're out. If you turned up with the wrong socks, that's a strike. Your punctuation, your discipline, everything had to be on point. No altercations, no drinking problems, no, no, no problems. You had to turn up like a racehorse, like a machine and produce the goods. So... I came up with a saying when I was young, um, I'm a champion on my worst day. When I'd been dropped, I used to say, I'm a champion on my worst day, I'm going to get back from this. When I had a relationship problem, I could not take the relationship problem into training. So we had a saying, leave your bags at the door. So I'm coming from an argument with my missus, my mood's down. When I get to St. Helens in the car park, I had to delete the problem and come back to it later and go in there and perform. I left my bags at the door. When I finished training, I left my bags at the door and didn't take training home. I went home then to fix the problem. Um, and um, so coming to this, right? I told my athletes when they're having a bad day, and in this particular time, I had a UFC wannabe, a girl that was aspiring to be a UFC fighter. She had no money. Um, she didn't have a car. She, she wasn't in the right relationship. Everything was going wrong for her, but she had a dream. And she rang me one day and um, she's crying on the phone. She says, look, this, this uh, fight is coming in from America. It's, um, it's a training session I need to get to, but it's 10 kilometers away. My boyfriend's took the car. I've got no money. What do I do? And she's crying. I says, you fucking run. You run. I don't care. You can sleep for a day. You run. You tell yourself, I'm a champion on my worst day. If you want this dream, you do not miss out on that on that coaching session. So she ran and she did two hours of, um, you know, jujitsu at the time it was. And she rang back and then she called me the next day after she had have a sleep and um, she was glad she did it. So then I had another client, then another client, then another client. I was telling all these clients, I'm a champion on my worst day. And then it really helped them. So then um, this man come up to me and he says, do me a favor. And I went, what? And he goes, make a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so I made the t-shirt and on the back, you know, it's got, I'm a champion on my worst day. And um, all my clients wear it with pride. And especially if they're having a bad day, they put it on, it triggers them and it looks good. I love it. And it suits, it suits your style and everything you've been talking about today. And uh, I bet it helps a hell of a lot of people on their worst days class right buddy that has been awesome today thank you so much if anybody has questions to ask mark 
please reach out. You will not regret it. Conversations with him have always been a highlight of my life when we've, uh, we've been able to do them and we'll have some more in the future now. All right. Edmore, cheers. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers, Mark. Bye. Hello and welcome back to the Profit Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Matt Robinson. We're back today as a pair, myself and Paul. We've also got a special guest on with us as well called Mark Edmondson. And this is a guy that goes way back with Paul, back to his Virgin Active days. And Mark's a really interesting character because he was a professional athlete himself in the field of rugby. And then he found himself over in Australia playing over there at the top of the game. And then once he got to the point where he retired, which came quite early for him, he then had to reinvent himself and go again. So he had to find a new identity. He became a peak performance coach. He's also had stints as a PT in the past, which is how his path crossed with Paul. So he's got a lot of things to share with us. He understands what it's like to be in our shoes running a fitness business. Um, and he's also great at just sharing stories around how to get the best out of yourself and get the best out of other people. So you might not have heard of this guy before, but I can guarantee that once you've listened to this, you're going to want to spend a lot more time consuming the stuff that he's sharing. So without further ado, let's jump into our interview with Mark Edmondson.